back. Hey, Brett, how's it going this week? Good, Ange. How are you? Good. Well, that means it's another episode of Money in the Bank, the podcast where we talk about all things personal finance and more. What, kind of whatever we dream up, so that's always fun. Right. So are you ready for your trivia question? Uh, yeah, I guess. Okay. What percentage of Americans live in an apartment? Uh, 40%? No. 20%. Okay, good. Which I think if you, you know, like, I think if you think about a city like Chicago or New York, it's obviously much higher. But then when you think about rural America, it drops to probably like zero, right? Yeah, because mean, when it, you're driving in the country, it's mostly like manufactured homes or or single family homes or like duplexes at best, right? Right. I mean, in small town, yeah, small town America, right? Everything is a house. In most of rural America, everything is a house. I was thinking like New York like had a substantial percentage of, of that condensed space and everybody's living on top of each other. So I thought it might be higher than it is. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. But that's still one in five Americans. Um, and if you kind of spread that out across the country, you know, that's that's a good number. And, and so why do I bring that up? Well, I bring that up because we were actually talking about recently how basically your needs are food, shelter, water, right? Mm-hmm. Basic human needs. And, but that's a huge variety on that scale, right? So, so some people think they're barely getting by and living in, you know, they're like, well, my house is so expensive and I I can't afford much else or whatever. Well, it's, if you look at the guy next to you, maybe he's spending half as much as you are on a house or an apartment or, or whatever. And he's downsized and your basic human need is just having shelter, not having like nice shelter, Right? Just a roof over your head. Right, because, I mean, on one side of the spectrum, you have, like, the survivor team that is living in a hut that has, you know, made out of leaves and sticks and stuff, and then they're eating rice. And on the other hand, you have the 1%, right, that live in a house that could hold, uh, I don't know, 50 to 80 people. And, right, they every meal that they eat is something probably that costs more money than the entire GDP of a third world country. Right. Exactly. So you, yeah, you really have the full spectrum there. And so sometimes when I start talking to people who are like, you're crazy, you know, I can't save the amount of money you can, or I can't do this. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, you look at these big expenses and that's where you can really make up a difference, right? Even with food, we talk about that all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, those, your big three expenses are housing, food, and transportation. So if you can reduce any of those areas, And I think the biggest one for a lot of people, I mean, up to a third of most people's income goes to having a roof over their head. So if you can find ways to house hack or, you know, downsize, that's huge, right? Right. And I think I think from a mentality for the last, I don't know, 60 years, ever since like the concept of the nuclear family kind of came into play where, you know, it was going to be wife, kids, uh, you know, a couple kids living with the house with the white picket fence, everybody was like trying to move toward that model. And they were like, that's the definition of success was to have, was to have that. And then the bigger I have of that, the more successful I am. But the, you can be wildly more successful if you dial that back. Right. Right. Because, you know, proving that you're that successful costs a lot of money. Exactly. if, If the goal is to like have more money faster in your life, to be able to retire first or go, you know, have more freedom or travel or have less expenses overall, then you don't want to have the biggest house on the block. Well, and I also kind of want to throw out the advice that, you know, some people get into a starter home and then they feel like they have to get out of it and get into a bigger home, maybe when they have their first kid or maybe their second kid. And sometimes if you can delay that second home purchase, even just a few years, And save that money, you can actually put 20% down on your next home still. You know, when when you sell your first house and then roll it into your second house, you can still have that 20% down or you can still keep your payments very manageable. And so sometimes just giving, you know, taking a few more years to, I guess, graduate to the next level can also really help, right? Right. Make all the difference in the world if you're not paying extra interest or have a PMI on that next property or that that next mortgage, right, that, that you just incur all these penalties. And so, you know, just a bit on that note. So, you know, Brett and I don't have kids yet, but we have several friends 
that have had kids. I have stayed in their, you know, houses with them and done well. Um, And then on the flip side, we've known people who have had kids that want to get into that bigger space for their kids. And I always like to, you know, tell people when I grew up, when I was um, up until, you know, I moved when I was younger, up until, I, you know, I was in kindergarten, I actually shared a room with my sister and my parents raised three of us girls in a ranch that was, I believe, right around 900 square feet. And we didn't, like, feel like we were missing out on anything because we didn't have a bigger house. Right. Yeah. When I grew up, I don't think our house was very big either for me and my sister, you know, for the most part. And, right. And yeah. it was just fine. Not compared to what we know about today and, like, yeah, people we see around us getting, like, these ma- massive, massive places. And I will say, you know, just the average ho- size of a home in the last even, you know, 30 years in this country has just ballooned up. But I think, and kind of what we're really here to talk about today, is um, now we're kind of starting to see that trend reversing. And starting with really the millennial generation, we're seeing people who don't want McMansions and don't want necessarily just these huge sprawling houses, but are making different decisions and voting with their dollars in different ways. Right. And I mean, the trend for community living again is becoming more popular. I mean, that was a very popular and common concept like when when your grandparents were growing up right so in the 50s 40s right yeah you live in like a even a medium-sized city and just like live together with a group of people and like help each other out and nobody cares about each other anymore they're just you know trying to do their own thing trying to you know incomplete their own goals and their own journey well you say that but studies have actually shown that if you can connect with a community in your neighborhood or a co-op type housing situation Um, that actually leads to happier people overall. Because having that network of people you can rely on or, you know, if, you know, my grandparents lived in a co-op when they were, you know, younger, raising their young kids. And yeah, my grandma even mentioned, like, knowing that she could call on her neighbor to watch the kids for a few minutes if she needed to run up to the store or something. I mean, just having that support network is huge, right? And you hear all these, you know, young moms talking about how, hard it is to find time to go to the grocery store or how hard it is to find time for themselves. And then if you think about it, if they had this network where it's like, oh, you know, we share a backyard. So, you know, do you mind if you watch my my kid while I get some housework done inside since you're out here anyways and the kids can play together? That's like a win-win, right? I mean, that's where the mantra that it takes a village came from, right? Yeah. So, So really lately, we've been kind of doing a thought exercise of what if we moved back into an apartment? Right, so currently have, this is the second house that we live in, if we got rid of this house and moved back into the model that we started in, right, which was yeah, shared living or apartment living, um, you know, back in, back, like back in the day. And what, what are your thoughts on that? Would you be able to downsize and live in a smaller space again, or do you like having a home? I think, I think for us, or me personally, I, I don't find a whole lot of value from having the maintenance that comes with a house, the chores that come with a house. Like, the, in that value co- equation, I'm not seeing as much benefit from having, like, the backyard, the, you know, the trees and the leaves. And, like, you know, you know I, I look at having, like, this nice shaded area that we live in. And, like, in the fall, it's a huge pain in the butt. And in the summer, I have to, like, maintain this grass and, like, keep it, you know, the goal is to keep it watered and alive and, you know, looking pretty. And there's a lot of stress and requirements that come with, like, all my neighbors that are, like, man, have, like, these manicured lawns. And I feel like, you know, I'm less of a person if I, like, don't care about that or I don't want to take care of those things or I don't want to waste the water on my grass because that's ridiculous. Well, and so then I think we get ourselves into this cycle of, you know, we both work full-time jobs and we have other hobbies But then on the weekend, we really have to block off a day or at least half a day to mow our yard and weed whack and water it and plant flowers and get mulch and just whatever else, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. so much of our free time ends up circling back to our house. And at the end of the day, for what? You know, what value does that add to our life? And for some people who are like very content putzing around the yard, that's great. But I think for us, like, we don't care about having the world's best yard. And so then we're like, we just wasted all this time, like, weed whacking, and we get to do it again next week. Right. Yeah, it never ends. Like, it's perpetual chores that, you know, for whatever reason, that's become the cultural norm. 
uh, it's still, yeah, let's take care of this grass that doesn't just like get to a point of it exists and then you maintain it. It just, yeah, you have to keep doing it every week over and over again. And right. It never ends. And, and I think for me, you know, I like to do things where there's a lot of tasks that I do in life that are repetitive, but some usually it's like, well, I'm improving, right? Like when I practice my guitar, for example, it's not, it's like, sure, somebody could say, well, you're playing the same song every week, but every week I find it, you know, getting easier and get, you know, getting my skills built up or, or being able to branch out and play a new song. With weed whacking, it's like, run machine over grass until it's gone and then <laughs> rinse and repeat. But there is no like, maybe there's like getting better at it, but like there's skill, there's no skill tree. Yeah. Trying, trying like, to climb. Right. Yeah. It's not like I'm going to start like making cooler designs in my yard. It's just like, you can get more efficient at it by buying more expensive equipment to like do it more effectively. Right. right? Like bigger, bigger and better stuff. Right. That's, but that's like the constant chase. Kind of like we were talking about with a bigger and better house. And then with the bigger and better house comes bigger and better chores. <laughs> right, yeah. And it's never ending. So, uh, yeah, Brett and I recently kind of went through the thought process of what if we were to relocate back into an apartment? And I think both of us feel like we wouldn't be giving up a whole lot. And I guess we would. We'd be giving up a yard and, a you know square footage very likely but we'd be gaining freedom which is funny because that's what usually people say when they move out to the suburbs from like a big city is like they want to have more freedom so like they have the freedom to like park their car in the garage or they have the freedom to control like their garden and yard and like all this other stuff but yeah i would say in our opinion you have more freedom when you have less of that responsibility for the sake of having responsibility. Right. So let's just rewind and let's let's go off of where we lived in Chicago because that was a familiar setting. So um, we'll, we'll go with your apartment because, you know, it was nicer. Um, <laughs> so that was a one bedroom, but large bedroom, I would say. Um, so I think that apartment was probably 750 square feet or so. Uh, I don't even know if it was that big. I think it was like 700. Okay. It was like 690. Well, right right in there. Um, but I would say within, when you walked outside and you, you know, immediately turned within one block, you had access to a super nice park mm-hmm. and loads of green space. So in my mind, I guess for me personally, any activity I would do in a yard, let's say friends come down and want to play cornhole, we could go up to the park. Right. So it was one block over rather than like opening your sliding glass door and walking yes. out in the back on your deck, right? Exactly. But for the sake of that, right, it's a trade-off. And the trade-off is I don't have to maintain a deck or I don't have to pay to build a deck or I don't have to pay to resurface my deck with really expensive boards that don't deteriorate when my crappy wooden boards, you know, finally deteriorate. Or I don't have to mow the lawn, right? So somebody's already taken care of that. So yeah, we it's it's a little bit more, you know, physical work for us to walk one extra block to go to that maintained park that, you know, taxes are paying for it. Or, you know, I have to maintain all of that other stuff just to be able to go use that, you know, whenever I feel like it. Right. Faster. Um, and so we do have a dog, which I feel like a lot of people will say, well, once you have a dog, you just need a house to make it easier, right? But actually, when we lived in Chicago, most of your neighbors had dogs, And I personally loved it because I'd be, like, in the elevator and I would just, like, get my dog fix in for the day, which was great. (laughs) But we actually dog sat um, when we lived in Chicago for some friends, and it wasn't that hard. I mean, yes, we had to, like, load them up into the elevator and walk them outside. But, you know, in hindsight, it's not... It's not the worst thing in the world to get out and go for a little walk and get some fresh air. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I didn't have to just, like, tie them up and, like, let the string run out of our, out our back door like we've done for watching some other dogs that have visited us. But I was going out anyway, or I'm, like, you know, I'm out on the street or I'm going down there regardless, so I might as well take the dog with me to go with me on the walk. Right. Or if I'm going to go to the store, like, I can take the dog with me to the store in that location, which is awesome. That's true. I mean, I will say there were still times that we were just, you know, in the morning we'd wake up, have to take the dog out. But I, I think, I think sometimes people make these inconveniences out to be bigger. Like when you're, it's easy to start complaining, right? Like, oh, I live in an apartment. I always have to take my dog downstairs. And then you move into a house and it's like, oh, this is so much easier. 
And I think it is, but then there's trade-offs, right? So yes, maybe that's one area that's easier in an apartment, but then honestly having to mow and maintain that grass in the first place probably still ends up being more work. Right. So it's, a, I mean, it's a trade-off. There's, there's the pros and cons there, right? Some people would find it extremely valuable to like just be able to open the door and let the dog outside versus, you know, never having to like walk down the street, right? But what is that cost? So it, let's say that those are an even balance from a, from a workload perspective. You have way more expense with that house than you did with that same size apartment. Right. Because, like, now you're paying property taxes and you're paying for all the stuff that it takes to maintain that yard. So it's, like, fertilizer or and water and, uh, you know, if you're actually taking care of it, uh, the lawnmower. You know, you have a lot of, like, upfront expenses that take care, you know, take care of that house in the first place that you don't have to eat when you're in an apartment. I think that's kind of why we started thinking about this in the first place is if you tried to reverse all of the investment that you've had into your house – equity and mortgage is is one part of it but all the other expenses filling it full of stuff right if i go from a uh what did i say 700 square foot apartment to you know a 1700 square foot house not even a big you know not even a huge house right i'm gonna fill it with so much more stuff and if you're in that house right now you should look at what would it take to downsize back to that that 700 square foot apartment because then you just like realize that you have all of this stuff in this house and you don't even need 90% of it. So are there any examples you could give us um, when you kind of look at your possessions personally, what are some things that you're like, wow, these are, this is all the stuff I've accumulated that I only have accumulated because I'm in a home. So we have a lot of like decoration related things for the holidays and stuff maybe you keep some of that stuff around if you live in an apartment but you don't have the physical space to say like that's a great idea i'm gonna have like i'm gonna dedicate 50 percent of my whole closet space to storing stuff for christmas and easter and holidays and, right you know fall decorations and kitchen towels and stuff and, like none of that stuff exists when you don't have the space for it and some of the, I mean, some of the bigger items is everything we have in our garage today. So it's the lawnmower, the snowblower, uh, I mean, golf clubs in that case, you know, all, all the recreational activity stuff that we have that we, you know, have the luxury to do occasionally, but usually don't. So it's just like there just in case we go. Right? You, have, you have so many things that are just in case related. Um, tons and tons of tools that are related for taking care of the yard. Like you said, the weed whacker. Uh, like I said, the, the lawnmower, but like the blower, um, you know, for, for cleaning up leaves and stuff, tree trimmers and snippers and clippers and, you know, just like random things that you buy that you like will go through Home Depot and you're like, oh, this would be helpful, right? You just pick up so much stuff as you go along um, that are just like little kind of what would be considered knickknacks. And none of that stuff would be applicable if we moved back into a non-managed or into a managed space. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought up like some of the extra yard stuff like clippers or shovels or rakes and these are all things that we've actually tried to make a pretty good effort to not acquire too much stuff in our house home ownership journey I would say in general and that there are things that over time as we've owned homes we've realized it's so much easier to build that community in your neighborhood and instead of you know, so one example um, that is quite embarrassing, when we moved into our old house, Brett was traveling for work and I locked myself out um, of the of the home, but I could get into the garage. And the ladder that we had wouldn't reach high enough because I knew I left our like second story bedroom window open. That day. Yeah. And that day, and my ladder wouldn't reach high enough, but my neighbor had one that did reach high enough. So instead of like feeling like I needed to buy a taller ladder... Anytime we needed a ladder, we would just say, hey, you know, can we use yours? And, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, let's get together for, you know, a beer, you know, come on over for a beer out of my fridge as a thank you. So then not only did we get to use the tool we needed, but we built that community relationship where, you know, then maybe if we had something he needed, it, he felt like it was easier to ask us, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can do that, that's actually the right answer. Because if you think about, you know, like a lot of neighborhoods that people are living in, how many times are you and your neighbor mowing at the same time even, let alone using like hedge trimmers at the same time? It makes a lot of sense to just like, you know, do the neighborly thing and like share some of that. 
But even with us having that mentality, we've looked around and been like, wow, there's so much that if we were to downsize or move back into an apartment someday, none of this would make the cut. And we don't really care about any of it. Like, we just have to have it to maintain our house. Right. And I mean, it was it was so expensive to like build up to where we are now over time. Right. And then all of it is like throw away, basically. It's even difficult to sell a lot of the stuff that we've gone through and kind of inventoried in our house of, you know, some of the bigger stuff, like somebody's going to probably buy a lawnmower because it's not that old or or washer and dryer because those are, you know, not in bad condition and stuff like that that are, are major things. That were kind of expensive, but we're not going to get a great return on that stuff, right? Like, we're right. lucky if we can sell it for, you know, a tenth of what it costs or 20% of what it costs when we bought it originally. But it's it's all the other stuff. Like, we have so much stuff in the house right now that we've just accumulated from holidays and move-in parties and, like, just being homeowners from family and friends and whatever. Nobody would even buy that stuff or pick it up for free. If right. we tried to like downsize it because it's not going to physically fit in our, you know, desired space in the future. So, you know, where does that go? And that just, you know, basically this is the short answer for I moved into a house when I was 20. I retired when I'm 65. What happens to all that crap in the middle? It goes into a landfill somewhere, right? Right. And so like our household family for only living here for, you know, three years in our old house, two years in our new house. We have so much stuff already you know, we could, all of that could be wasted. Well, and I think what's really, you know, and I think it's been interesting because I've been able to watch kind of this journey with my grandparents and watch them, you know, downsize over time. And yeah, you you get to the end of life and you don't care about stuff. It's like we buy it to fill our time, to fill the houses that we think we want. But ultimately, is that what brings us happiness? And and one other point I want to make is Brett and I have like very aware we've been very aware this whole time of not trying to bring in too much extra stuff but one example i wanted to give is i wouldn't i know a lot of people in the homes they live in they have an eat-in kitchen and a dining room and if we if we had that situation there's no way we would move two tables back into a condo or an apartment right that's ridiculous i mean in furniture also right you have you know let's say your basement is finished up in the midwest because you have basements up here usually that's an entire living area let alone the upstairs actual living area for your real living and some people have two living rooms upstairs like a family room and a living room correct yeah so that's that's three whole sets of furniture probably multiple tvs you know that are in each room plus all the bedrooms now they all have tvs whether you have cable or not um you know multiple desks or you know for each of the kids and and you know workstations and dressers and you know all this other you know stuff that goes along with that but yeah i mean what what am i going to do with five sets of furniture for each room right or just, or just tables and, and stuff i and think lamps? you know if you are somebody who is like oh you know i've been looking at buying my next home and i want a bigger space kind of ask yourself you know do i really need all of these areas you know you you just said like three living room sets even if you have kids that might use one area and you can go to the other area, what's going on with that third one, you know? <laughs> and like, yeah, if you put TVs, you know, upstairs, downstairs in the kitchen and all the bedrooms, you might have five, six TVs in your house. How many are you watching at once? Mm-hmm. And I think the more you, and maybe this it's just because it's worked for us, but the more we started realizing how little we use some of the stuff in our house, the more that we're willing to consider the idea in the future that maybe like downsizing is is still the right answer right and getting getting out of the way of the nuclear family and moving back into you know smaller living space shared spaces uh closer to things that are like awesome and not have to like move way out into a suburb and you know then drive back into where things are entertaining right right just living in an area where things are entertaining in the first place and just being able to you know, physically access that stuff much more easily. And again, I would say this all comes down to preference because some people get into a city and or a city type setting. Um, You know, we technically do live in a suburb, even though we live in a, you know, mid-sized, I would say, Midwest city. We still live in a suburb of that. So it's not really walkable for us to go grab a bite to eat, right? 
Um, but there are parts of our town that are that way. And some people don't like that type of lifestyle, right? They want the yard, the spread out big lots and whatever. Some people, this is what they want. But I think the key is, be, you know, I bought my first house when I was 22, 23, somewhere right in there. I don't think I knew what I wanted. I was just trying to mimic what everybody was telling me I wanted. Right. And I, I'd say a lot of people that I talk to now that are in that age range, they they buy a house because they feel like they're wasting their money by living in an apartment. And the right answer, because that's what everybody else does, is to get a house and like start that lifestyle as soon as they can afford it. Right. Or even before they can afford it. And I would say the more that we've progressed down this road... The more that I'm not sure that's the right answer all the time. And I, I think the more important thing is to figure out what makes you happy. And one thing for Brett and I is traveling for extended periods at a time. We've gone to Europe twice now for almost a month both times. And when we do that, we have to find somebody who's going to check on our house and ch- you know mow our yard and take care of everything for us, which luckily, you know, we've been able to do that. But ultimately, would our life be easier if we could just like lock the apartment door and everything's already taken care of for us? Right. And I mean, you can go in between, right, and get like a condo that has, you know, it's a a building that has a yard, but it's, you know, all the the yards taken care of and the snowplow comes and it removes everything. And there's maybe facilities on site with a gym and a pool and all those things. That's more expensive, right? When you think of like managed living, that is that is more expensive probably overall. You're probably paying more for that than maybe living in a house because you're still on the hook for all the property taxes. Right. You're just paying, you're, you're basically buying a house and then paying a bunch of people to like do maintenance on that house, right? So that's, that's probably the most expensive equation. If you're willing to buy a house uh, of the same size and do all the work yourself, it's cheaper. But then, yeah, you have to do all the work yourself. And so... If you don't enjoy doing that, then you'd pay for it anyway. Well, and I think but- you, you know, a good point was that you just said, though, is of the same size. So, you know, Brett and I have kind of come to the realization that even 1,700 square feet is a little big for us. We don't use a lot of our space still. And we've talked about potentially downsizing, even maybe into a house or a condo. But even if we did that, just from moving from 1,700 square feet to, let's say, 1,200 square feet, we would just save a lot of money because we're willing to give up space that we're not using. And I actually saw, you know, a report one time talking about if you put a heat map of where people actually spent time in their house, it's concentrated to like the bedroom, the kitchen, and the dining room or something like that, you know? Yeah. And it really depends on the layout of the house and stuff and where all the toys are and TVs and where people gravitate. But yeah, most of your house, you know, 50% of your house is probably not accessed. And right, we currently do not have any kids. So right, that's part of that equation also is people want to have a bigger house because they don't want to like see their kids that often, right? So they like say like there's a playroom here and they have their own room here and we need to double the size of our house so we can like all have our own like space. And usually that's not true. I didn't grow up in a model like that necessarily. I mean, I did have my own room as a kid um, because my sister basically moved out by the time I was like five. So, you know, relatively um, had my own stuff, but it's not like our, we had more than one living room or we had, you know, the kitchen was like that huge that I like couldn't be in there at the same time as my parents. Like there was a kitchen table right next to where the kitchen was. And like I sat at the kitchen table, did homework and my parents like made lunch or whatever. Right. right? And we were all kind of a family together, like in the same spot. Well, and so one example I want to give, because I think it's a very, creative example is there's this blogger that I followed for years and she lives in New York and she has two daughters and she has actually owned the you know condo that she lives in which is you know New York so it's a high rise but she's actually owned it I think for the past you know 10 to 15 years something longer than she's had kids and she has actually been open with the fact that she thought about moving but New York is obviously really expensive so just to get one extra bedroom is like what you would pay for an entire house somewhere else, you know? And so she's actually made the decision that she wants to raise her kids in the city because she likes living in the city and her daughters share a bedroom. So, I mean, they're in a small two-bedroom, you know, condo or apartment in New York. But the benefit is they're, you know, they don't spend all that much time inside because they're out at museums or walking around or they go to parks. And 
you know, so I think you can make the, the other thing I've realized in life is there's people living in all sorts of situations and circumstances and you can make it work. You know, growing up, I grew up in the area we live in now and I always just thought, you know, I'm normal kid, live in a house, whatever. Now when, on my way to biking to work, I see there's probably 20 to 30 kids that wait at the bus stop right by an apartment on my way to work. It's totally possible to have kids and live in an apartment. Right. I mean, everybody does it all over the world, right? Right. You don't think, you don't think everybody lives in like small, smaller housing in a big city, like in London or, you know, obviously like India, like everybody's wall to wall in like Mumbai and Hyderabad, right? People have families in big cities on top of each other in apartment complexes everywhere in the entire world. And I feel like a lot of people that either we're connected to or that are in like the middle to upper class in the United States where they all just live in the suburbs or live in areas that only have big houses, you know, don't realize that or they forget about that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, no, like I could never live in anything besides a 3,000 square foot house to have two or three kids. I'm like, well, they're doing it in New York. They're doing it in Chicago. They're doing it in San Francisco. Like people do this everywhere. And it's not because they're poor. It's because right. it's totally a thing that is possible to do successfully. Right. And it just changes how you spend your time. So instead of spending your time taking care of your yard, you're spending your time walking up to a park. And I'm not saying one is good or bad. It's just very different. But it's possible to do either one. And I think what we really try to encourage on this podcast is to always think outside the box and, you know, don't be afraid to go against social norms. So... I think for us, we've followed the social norm for a long time, and maybe we won't keep doing it. Who knows? Right. I mean, there's probably not a a right answer to, you know, silver bullet for every single person. Again, you know, people want to have the yard because they want to have it or they love taking care of it. Obviously, both of our parents, like, live for, like, making their lawn look immaculate. Like, that is a huge part of their lifestyle. It's a huge part of the happiness factor of their life. So... Right. I, I'm not going to yep. say take that away and you should no. live in an apartment because it's more cost effective. Right. right? <laughs> I feel like we would never say that. I think the big thing we always say is figure out what's important in your life. And that's how you should prioritize your dollars. Right. Especially for the people that are on the fence. Like, that, like, should I continue living here? Should I continue saving money? Do I need to like save up for a house? Maybe your goals when you're 19 and 20 years old and 21 getting your first job, 22 you don't need to buy it or save up for a big house. Maybe you like start investing in a mutual fund that early on and it's going to put you super far ahead in life because right. all the equity that you were going to put toward a house goes straight into that, you know, compound interest and you you come out way ahead because you're totally fine living in an apartment for the next like 20, 30, 40 years. Right. And and you know there you know I've also seen examples of people who stay living in smaller spaces. There's so many people out in like the financial independence blogger space that have done this, that have talked about it. And all of their friends and family were like, when are you going to move out of this, you know, small apartment? Because it's seen as a bad thing. And I'm just here to tell you, it's not a bad thing. If you are comfortable where you're living, but you're just feeling this pressure to move out, don't do it. Like, if you're happy where you are and you're content, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of your situation. I... My apartment in Chicago was, you know, pretty shitty, but I loved it. And so for me, it was the perfect place to be. And, you know, if we still lived there, we we would definitely still be living in the city in a shoebox apartment because for us, not having to commute out to the suburbs mattered, you know, more than anything else. Right. And for the square footage we had in that space that we were totally fine with, it's way cheaper to upgrade like a kitchen or the living room or the flooring, right? Right. Than it is to do in an entire house. Oh, yeah, that's the other beauty. We could live in like a real nice looking apartment, right? For for a fraction of what it would be to do anything to a house. That's true. And then we don't have to maintain the spaces, so. (laughs) And, And we're winning, you know, for us, like, there are genuine people out there who like to shovel and like to snow blow. And man, if you want to, you know, live rent free, do I got a room for you? Because I do (laughs) not like to shovel and winter is coming. Um, But you know, and I, I think that's the big lesson from this whole podcast is just figure out what makes you happy and go for that in life and don't let the pressure of society change you. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's not a it's not a sure thing from a financial perspective that apartment living is more expensive long term than living in a house right 
if you look at a mortgage calculator and say like my rent is higher than my mortgage so therefore i should be in a house you're missing a whole lot of variables in that yeah. equation right the houses are so much more expensive than just that one factor for the mortgage right property taxes all the junk that we talked about buying and all the stuff maintaining stuff replacing things that break you know, and if, opportunity cost of having your equity tied up in yeah. a home. And yeah, if you have a three hundred thousand dollar house and you've got all, let's say you bought it in cash on day one, right? That's that's three hundred thousand dollars that you're not, um, you know, you don't have in the bank gaining interest, or you don't have an investment gaining interest for thirty years or whatever, you know, or for the full life of your house, 40, 50 years before you retire and try and pull that out. Right. So if you're if you're only paying. You know, thousand dollars a month for an apartment, or fifteen hundred dollars a month for an apartment. It's going to take you a long time before you get to that three hundred thousand dollars, right? And all of the time that it takes to get there, you're gaining interest on that on that money, right? So, and it's doubling every ten years. So good luck trying to keep up with that. Yeah. So so it's it's in most circumstances it probably can be more cost effective to not buy a house, right? For, yeah. For certain people, if you're going, if your house is getting too big or too expensive. You know, that, that equation becomes a lot more, um, you know, easy to manage. But all right. All right. We've well, you're welcome, life. Brett, because yeah. I know that you've been wanting to do yet another episode shitting on home ownership. So <laughs> here you go. You got your wish. Um, I, now, just, I just love ranting. So. You know, I think the big thing is we're not shitting on home ownership. I think for a lot of people, it makes sense and there's intangible benefits. But for the people who are on the fence about it or people who aren't sure about it, just don't feel pressured. And... If you want me to help run numbers for you, I'm happy to do that because there's a lot of calculators out there and a lot of them are sponsored by mortgage companies. So whether (laughs) there's a bias, I'm not saying that, but there could be. Um, All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap this one up now. But as always, if you have any questions or if you want maybe an opinion on your situation or if you just want to say, hey, thanks, you know, I've been living in an apartment raising my kid and I'm so glad that one person is not telling me I have to move out of my 500 square foot place and you have an ally in me you know keep doing whatever makes you happy in life and for maybe that's you know also another listener who's sitting in a 5,000 square foot house laughing at us because they think it's great that good for you too it doesn't matter what end of the spectrum you are on just do what you want to do that's what we do so thanks for tuning in guys Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Money in the Bank. Make sure to subscribe to us on the iTunes or Stitcher app so that you get weekly alerts every time we post a podcast. Or if you want, you can visit my website, moneyinthebankpodcast.com. And if you want to reach out with any questions or further comments, please email me at angie at moneyinthebankpodcast.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Money in the Bank.